Starting in 2009, I spent five years completing a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science. I'll run through the more than 50 classes I took, along with commentary about what it was like to go through them. Going to school in the middle of Silicon Valley at this time was really interesting because so many influential hyper growth companies took off during that period, and I felt like I was in the middle of it. If you're interested in what I did over the summers, I made a separate video about all the jobs I took on while a student. So I'll leave a link for that in the description if you're interested. In high school, my dream school was actually Caltech. My brother was already studying there and I was just in awe of the raw intellectual horsepower of everyone I knew who had attended Caltech. I attended the Caltech pre-frosh weekend first and if I had to summarize the whole weekend, it would be aggressive nerdiness. But it just was a totally different vibe when I visited Stanford which if I had to describe in one word, it just felt like opportunity. I arrived at Stanford in September 2009 with the intention of either majoring in math or physics. One of the nice things about Stanford is that you have the freedom to choose what to study once you arrive on campus, which I know is different from a lot of schools which force you to pick the engineering school or business school or sciences school, for example, um, even before you arrive as a freshman. And I think that's totally crazy because how do you know as a 17 or 18 year old what you want to make your career in when you haven't even taken that many classes in that domain. I had done a lot of math competitions in high school where I was considered very good, but I had a nasty awakening when I arrived at Stanford where I actually discovered what true mathematical prowess looked like. And my freshman year roommate, he actually represented his country on the International Math Olympiad. And then uh, another student down the hall from me freshman year was actually on the US physics team. And so for math, I had the option of taking 51 or 51H. And they both covered linear algebra, but 51H was the honors version, which meant that it was much more theoretical and focused on proofs, though I dropped down into 51. And I still really enjoyed the class. Linear algebra is really fundamental to a lot of computer science, including cryptography, graphics, machine learning. I also took a one unit extension course to the linear algebra class, which covered the MATLAB programming language. And I honestly don't think I did anything special for the course, but I somehow ended up with an A+. Plus. <laughs> and I think that's largely because Stanford has a decent amount of grade inflation. For example, the average grade in the introductory programming class, CS106A, was an A-. minus. On the other hand, Berkeley, which is Stanford's rival school across the bay, the average grade for most classes was like a B or a B-. minus. In general, life for Berkeley students is just gonna be more miserable compared to an average Stanford student. Uh, there, there's an old joke that went around, what's the only thing that a Stanford and Berkeley student have in common? They both hate Berkeley. Da, 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 da. These intro programming classes were some of the most popular classes in the whole school. And I think there were two reasons for that. Number one, Stanford made sure the people who taught these classes were the highest quality and most entertaining teachers. So for me, Mehran Sahami taught 106A, and he would literally throw out candy to every single person who asked a question, and he would have a whole lineup of jokes every lecture. The second reason why these classes were so popular is because they were designed to be approachable to everyone. They weren't weeder classes to scare you away, and Stanford actually encouraged you to take the intro programming even if you weren't a computer science major. So 106A was my first real experience with programming, and I had a lot of fun programming with Carol the robot and then eventually with some Java programs. All freshmen had to take something called Introduction to Humanities, otherwise known as IHUM, and the one I took was called Freedom, Equality, and Difference. And I don't remember much of what I actually learned in the class, but I do remember I got a B. And that was a really big deal for me because I had never gotten a B in high school. And then right here in my first quarter at Stanford, I got a B. Stanford is on the quarter system, not the semester system, which means that usually students will take classes in the fall, winter, and spring quarter. And each quarter is around 10 weeks long. So quite a bit shorter than a typical semester at another school. And the upside of that is that you had the opportunity to take a bunch of classes, but the downside was that you would have an exam or a midterm, usually like by the third or fourth week of the quarter. So you always felt like you were on this treadmill of taking exams. In winter, I took the next part of the programming sequence, CS106B, which again was really, really well taught. Um, Stanford actually has dedicated teaching faculty, which means that these are people who their entire responsibility is to teach and they're hired because of the quality of their teaching. I know a lot of schools actually have uh, research faculty, and then these researchers are forced to teach undergrads, right? They're hired in because of exceptional research work, and they may not be really good lecturers. So that never really made sense to me. And so I, I really liked Stanford's approach of hiring dedicated, excellent lecturers and teachers. This class was taught in C++, and it was really fundamental to 
all of programming because we learned about data structures like stacks, queues, arrays, and some concepts like recursion. This quarter involved a ton of writing. So I first took Phil 20, which was an introduction to different ethical theories, like from Kant or Mills. I also did IHUM part two, and this was a class focused on Chinese family structures, which is super interesting. Um, and I wanted to make up for the B I had gotten in fall quarter. And so I spent a lot more time this time writing my essays and getting feedback. And the postdoc who taught my particular section of IHUM, he was really tough, but also really fair. And so I would go to his office hours and get feedback. And I actually ended up rewriting a lot of my essays two or three times that quarter. And that was, I think, a large part of why I ended up getting an A this time around. And I feel like a lot of my enjoyment of writing that I have today actually came from this particular class. Finally, the last class I took was Math 52, multivariable calculus. But I did so poorly on the first exam that I ended up dropping the class. Um, and so at this point, I got a B in my first quarter at Stanford. I had to withdraw from a second class at Stanford. So my ego was sufficiently bruised. In spring, I took that multivariable calculus math class one more time. And just like I learned my lesson for IHUM, I spent a lot of extra time preparing for the midterm and the final in Math 52 this quarter, and I ended up with an A+. I think in general, in both school and in the professional world, it's actually okay to make a mistake. It's okay to screw up, but don't mess up in the same way twice. I didn't take any computer science classes this quarter. Instead, I wanted to explore if I wanted to do electrical engineering. And so I took E40, where we actually went into a lab and constructed circuits, and I blew up a lot of capacitors. I also decided to have a little bit more fun this quarter. I took a student-led seminar called Intro to Indian Classical Music, which was actually taught by two friends of mine. And these were friends who literally, they were some of the best young musicians in tabla and in Indian classical music. And the cliche is really true. Like the best part about Stanford, or the best part about any place, any company really, is the people. And I feel like with Stanford, you just had this really nice melting pot of smart, ambitious, and kind people who actually did the effort to like put on a seminar like this. Another one unit class I took was advanced tennis because I played a lot of tennis anyway, and I thought I might as well get some credit for it. I also took two writing classes. First was a continuation of that Chinese literature course called Rebellious Daughters and Filial Sons, which I thought was a really funny name. And I started one more sequence called Program and Writing or Rhetoric, usually referred to as power because writing is power, right? Um, and that one, it was a class about the multicultural identities in the US. And so that was really interesting for me because almost all the authors we read in that class were first generation immigrants um, from Vietnam, Mexico, India, China. So just like me, they had this thing of their parents were born in India, I was born here. And as a first generation, you have to kind of navigate the different cultural identities. I came into sophomore year at Stanford really excited to be back on campus because I had just spent a pretty lonely summer on my own in San Francisco. And coming back to campus, it was all this free food, this super nice gyms, and a really beautiful campus, which I didn't have any of that, you know, living on my own in SF. Um, and, and actually, one of the things I want to mention here is that some students assume that, okay, Stanford is private school. It must be super expensive. But for me, actually, it was the cheapest college option I had. Uh, because Stanford's admission for domestic students, U.S. students, is need blind, Stanford actually offered a, enough financial aid to my family that it became the cheapest option for me. And I was able to graduate debt free. So before you assume that Stanford or any other comparable school is too expensive for you, I'd encourage you just to apply and check out what kind of financial aid package you might get. In fall quarter of my sophomore year, I took CS103, which was a really interesting class about complexity theory and what does it mean to be NP complete. I also took differential equations, which I frankly am not sure if I ever used. All of sophomore year, I took advanced Hindi, which was really chill and kind of a cheat code because I actually grew up speaking a dialect of Hindi at home. <laughs> um, and there was just me and one other student in the class, so it really felt like private tutoring. And the speaking part of Hindi came pretty easily for me compared to the other student who was like some European grad student. Um, <laughs> uh, but what I really benefited from was learning the grammar and writing of Hindi in a much more substantial way compared to what I had done before that. The highlight of my sophomore year was definitely big game, which is the annual football game between Stanford and Berkeley. And so this year, sophomore year, it was an away game. So I actually traveled to Berkeley to watch the game and Stanford just completely dominated Cal on the field. And in the post game celebration, a bunch of us, we went onto the field and I actually shook Andrew Luck's hand. And Andrew Luck is just such a nice person and also so talented. He's like by far my favorite football player definitely my favorite quarterback of all time in the NFL. Winter quarter, I did a one unit class about yoga because why not? 
Um, I did a class about object-oriented system design, which culminated in my first ever all-nighter uh, to try and get this huge Java program done with my group project. I took another mathematical computer science class, CS109, which is about probability. I took a general education requirement called engineering economy, and I took a seminar class called Alternative Spring Break, where we learned about homelessness. And we actually did a trip to learn about that during our spring break. Spring quarter, I took CS107, which is probably the closest thing that Stanford has to a weeder class because you were forced to write code in C and you had to have a pretty deep understanding of memory allocation and pointers. One of the most useful classes I took was a one unit class alongside 107 called CS1U, which was about practical Unix. And basically we covered things like how to use grep, diff, emacs, and simple bash scripting. And that kind of stuff makes you so much more productive as a developer. I also took CS154 here, which was about advanced complexity theory and automata. And I enjoyed the material of the class quite a bit, but I always had a hard time writing the proofs required in a reasonable amount of time during exams. I continued to take advanced Hindi, and I also did the second power class, the program in writing and rhetoric. And I also did another one unit core training class. To start off junior year, I took CS161, which is a class about data structures and algorithms and their runtime complexity, stuff that companies almost always ask you during interviews. I took the machine learning course by Professor Andrew Ng this quarter, and he was already fairly well known at this point, but he would go on to become even more famous for co-founding Coursera, co-creating co the Google Brain team, and uh, starting a VC fund with multi hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in AI companies. His class, CS229, was actually one of the most intense classes I took. And I remember distinctly, um, we had just taken a midterm, which was really difficult. And the first thing that Andrew Ng said when he walked in to collect all the papers was, okay, hey, it's time to start working on your final project. And it was a very depressing moment. The other time intensive thing that I did this quarter was a section leading program, which was a way to teach other undergrads about the intro programming classes. and. Um, this was a really good learning opportunity as teaching is the best way of learning. And also the community of section leaders was fantastic. Finally, I took a one unit class about Android development. I had just gotten my first smartphone ever and it happened to be an Android. Um, and I thought it would be cool to build an app for it. Um, but it turned out I really didn't like Android. Uh, we were using Eclipse for the IDE to develop the app. And a lot of Android development just didn't make that much sense to me. The whole paradigm of mobile development was quite confusing. And ironically, uh, even though I didn't like it at the time, I would end up making a career out of Android development. And starting in 2020, about two years ago, I've been teaching the Android class back at Stanford. So I kind of came full circle here. I started off 2012 taking an anthropology class for a general education requirement about the Incan empire in modern day Peru. And I think it was interesting, but I promptly forgot everything about the Incan empire as soon as I took the final exam. On the computer science side, I took the next systems course, CS110, which was okay, taught in C. Um, but the coolest part about it was that the professor was actually a co-founder of VMware. The other CS class I took was 124, which was natural language processing, taught by a linguist who actually was awarded the MacArthur Genius Fellowship Grant. Um, and actually that's one of the interesting things is that if I look at all the computer science classes I took, I would say like, 70% of the faculty actually had a Wikipedia page. So it was really cool to kind of learn from, from these really distinguished people. In spring quarter, I took 155, which was the class about computer security. I took a class about web applications, which I really loved because it was the first time I was able to build something and show it off to people. And after taking this class, I finally started to build my own side projects. Finally, I took a writing class within the CS major, which was uh, intersection of computer science, ethics, and public policy. And this class was really interesting at the time, but I feel like it's even more interesting and relevant today because more and more of our lives are being dictated by algorithms and data. And so it's really important that we have a framework for how to think about reducing harm or eliminating harm from these algorithms on different types of people. The last year of my undergrad, I started concurrently working on my master's degree in computer science. And so I actually ended up sticking around at Stanford for a fifth year um, through something called the Coterm program. So I'm not gonna cover those classes in too much detail here, but if you're interested in that, I'm happy to make another video. Just let me know in the comments. In the fall quarter, I took a graphics class taught by a professor who had actually won two Academy Awards for his work on the graphics in two movies, Pirates of the Caribbean and some of the Harry Potter movies. That, that was pretty cool. The other computer science class I took this quarter was 231A about computer vision. And the main thing I remember 
from this quarter was how difficult the exam was. So I think on that first midterm, I got like a 45%, which ended up being curved to a B plus. And I ended the class with an A minus, even though I felt just so horrible coming out of every exam I took. The professor who taught this class actually went on to become the chief scientist for AI at Google Cloud. One of the good parts about Stanford, and potentially it could be a bad thing depending on how you look at it, is that there's a ton of cross-pollination between the academics at Stanford and the companies in Silicon Valley. If you're a well-respected professor at Stanford, there's a ton of money to be made by consulting at a company or starting your own company or somehow engaging with industry. And Stanford is actually pretty permissive when it comes to allowing their faculty to engage in that kind of work. In the non-CS world, I took Introduction to Earth Systems, which was really depressing because it was basically a survey of how badly we were screwing up the planet. I also took a class about technology and religion in South Asia, which basically turned into a movie club. So we would watch a movie like Mother India and then debate what the murder at the end of the movie told us about Hindu culture. It was also really exciting for me because there was only one other person in the class. And so I'd end up watching every movie with her, one-on-one. -on -one. Winter quarter, I took two courses, Natural Language Understanding and Mining Massive Datasets, which counted toward my master's degree. I also took a two-quarter senior project sequence, which ended up being one of my favorite classes at Stanford. And the idea here is that across a six-month period, you would come up with an idea for an app, you would build it, and you would actually test it on real users. And so it really was a full cycle software development that you didn't really get on most classes. Right around this time, during my fourth year of undergrad, a friend of mine told me about this new app that his friend had developed, who was also a Stanford student. The idea was that the app would let you send a disappearing photo to someone. And my initial reaction was, what a stupid app. Why would you want to send basically a normal photo, but it would be lower quality and the photo would actually disappear. I initially ignored the idea, but eventually, because so many of my friends were getting on it, I eventually downloaded it and started using it. And of course, this app was Snapchat. And a bunch of my friends actually went on to join the company full-time later that year. My last undergrad quarter at Stanford was really challenging. I took CS143, which is compilers, a notoriously difficult class where you basically implement a compiler for a made-up programming language. But my partner and I, we somehow always ended up procrastinating and getting delayed when it came to submission time. If you submitted late, every hour past the deadline, you would get 2% off your project grade. And that led to this really messed up draconian psychology where you know we would stay up for like 16, 24 hours um, prior to the deadline. And of course we didn't finish. And so now we had to answer the question, should we try and fry our brains a little bit more to try and get more test cases to pass or just submit what we have and cut our losses. And clearly we uh, didn't do the math correct because the grade I got in compilers was by far the lowest grade I'd gotten in any CS class. But I still think I learned a decent amount about not procrastinating. Along with continuing the senior project class, I also took an information retrieval class, which was actually taught by two vice presidents at Google. This is pretty much the reverse of, of what I said earlier. In addition to having a lot of academics who go out to industry, you also have this huge density of really smart and talented people in industry who want to come back and teach students. This class was a good example of two really esteemed uh, operators at Google who would come back and talk about inform information retrieval and how it was actually being used at Google. And then finally, I did two one unit classes this quarter, uh, one about law for professional software engineers, and second, about financial literacy. I ended up graduating with a cumulative 3.83 GPA for my undergrad degree, which was enough to qualify me to graduate with distinction. And I don't think it's because I was particularly talented, but I do think I worked pretty hard. And in general, the average GPA at Stanford would be higher than the average GPA at Berkeley or Princeton. I really hope that was helpful. Um, this video focused primarily on the courses I took at Stanford, but I actually feel like a lot of the value of my education came not from the problem sets or courses I took, but much more from the people I learned from and the people I got inspired from. That's why with COVID, I really feel like if you're not able to be on a campus and interact meaningfully with students or faculty, the value proposition for a traditional university is a lot less clear. If this trend of remote school or hybrid school continues, I'm actually really bearish on the traditional four-year education. And I think a lot of the content that you can find on YouTube or other platforms is going to take over as the primary way that people look for content. I spend a lot of time now thinking about software engineering careers and how I can help people become better and faster at their job as a software engineer. 
So if you wanna join me on that journey and you wanna watch more content like this, hit that subscribe button and let me know in the comments what you're interested in. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.